Section one. You will hear a woman telephoning a car rental company to ask about car renting services. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello, First Choice Car Rental. How may I help you? Oh, good morning. Um, I'm calling for some information about your car renting services. I'm an American, and I will be going on a family holiday to your city from Ohio next month. The woman says that she is an American, so American has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hello, First Choice Car Rental. How may I help you? Oh, good morning. Um. I'm calling for some information about your car renting services. I'm an American, and I will be going on a family holiday to your city from Ohio next month. Okay, no problem. It's our pleasure to serve you. Could you please tell me your name and contact information first? I'm Caroline. That's C A R O L I N E, and my telephone number is O four one nine. Okay, I've got that. And how can I send you our quotation? If you are satisfied with our arrangement, is email all right, or should I send it by post? The latter, please. I'm afraid I'd prefer to read it on paper. That's no problem. I'm considering renting a caravan for a week, but I don't really know the price range for it since I haven't rented any car through that method before. I think it should be within my budget of fifty dollars. You know. We have various caravans at different renting prices, according to the class of vehicle, facilities inside, mileage, etc. I'd recommend the Explorer, taking your budget into consideration, which is of good value and will cost you thirty-nine dollars per day. Is that okay? Of course, that's fine for me. I know the Explorer. That could save me eleven dollars each day. You know, a family holiday will be costly. That van is perfect. I'm glad that you like it. So, do you have any particular requirements about your room in the van? Um, how many beds are there? One twin bed. But there are three of us: my mum, daughter, and me. So, can we add another bed? No problem. For the facilities, I think a kitchen is the most important, and of course the stove. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen. And answer questions six to ten. In our vans, such as Explorer, there are all the basic bedding materials you need, like pillows and blankets, as well as some equipment for daily life. And many things can be added into your room according to your needs, such as a coffee maker. Well, I need to have a heater in case it'll be cold at night, and a microwave, of course. All right. I've taken notes of all these things. Actually, all our vans should be taken from our company, which is not too far from the city center, so we can pick you up from the center for free. Is that okay? Oh, I'm afraid we'd better be picked up from the airport, as we are foreigners in your country and not familiar with the transport system. Is that all right? Yes, it is no problem. 
With that comes the information for the insurance. I need the driver's name and age. That is my daughter, Chris, who is 19, the youngest driver amongst us three. I'm sorry, but our company only accepts caravan drivers aged 25 or over, according to our regulations. So... Well, that would be me, Caroline, and I'm 49 years old. And where was your driving license issued? I mean the country. I've got a license in America, but I've also got one in Australia, which is still valid. Is it better for me to register the local one from your country? Yes, that might be better. So your registration number is... That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. You'll hear a talk between a host and a professor called Alison Downing about cocoa beans. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hello and welcome to today's talk. Here with me is the famous botanist, Professor Alison Downing. So, Alison, tell us something about cocoa beans. Cocoa beans, also called cacao beans, are the primary constituent in making chocolate, grown in tropical areas in South and Central America, West Africa and Asia. The cocoa tree is often raised on small family-owned farms. When the harvested pods are open to expose the beans, the pulp and cocoa seeds are removed and the rind is discarded. The pulp and seeds are then piled in heaps, placed in bins or laid out on grates for several days. During this time, the seeds and pulp undergo a process called sweating, where the thick pulp liquefies as it ferments. The fermented pulp trickles away, leaving cocoa seeds behind to be collected. This is when the beans are harvested and then the bags holding them are ready to be transported. But the most important step in processing the cocoa bean is cleaning it. Once the beans are unloaded from the railroad cars, the packages are opened and then weighed by machines. Then the pods are split and the seeds or beans are covered with a sweet white pulp or mucilage. On arrival at the factory, the cocoa beans are sorted and put in a hopper to be cleaned more rigorously. The wet beans are then transported to a facility so they can be fermented and dried. They are fermented for four to seven days and must be mixed every two days. They are dried for five to fourteen days, depending on the climate conditions. The fermented beans are dried by spreading them out over a large surface and constantly raking them. Then the beans are ready to be roasted. Now, Roasting takes place at a high temperature and then the beans are boiled in a heated chamber. During the roasting process, the beans will be expanded and cracked. But prior to this, the beans are trodden and shuffled about using bare human feet. During this process, red clay mixed with water is sprinkled over the beans to obtain a finer colour polish and protection against moulds during shipment to factories in the United States, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom and other countries. Now, back to what I was saying. After the beans are cracked, they need to be cooled. Then the roasted beans are sealed in pockets. Before you hear the rest of the talk, 
You have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Wow, that is not a simple process, is it? But someone told me that different roasting levels of coffee can lead to different kinds of flavours. Yes, roasting coffee transforms the chemical and physical properties of green coffee beans into roasted coffee products. The roasting process is what produces the characteristic flavour of coffee by causing the green coffee beans to change in taste. Unroasted beans contain similar if not higher levels of acids, protein, sugars and caffeine as those that have been roasted, but lack the taste of roasted coffee beans due to the Maillard and other chemical reactions that occur during roasting. The vast majority of coffee is roasted commercially on a large scale, but small-scale commercial roasting has grown significantly with the trend toward single-origin coffees served at specialty shops. Some coffee drinkers even roast coffee at home as a hobby in order to both experiment with the flavour profile of the beans and ensure the freshest possible roast. So here, I'm going to introduce some of these roasted coffee beans and their special flavours. Now, the first crack is lighter bodied and has a higher acidity level with no obvious roast flavour and is popular for its special mild taste. This level of roast is ideal for tasting the full original character of the coffee. The green beans are raw, unroasted coffee beans. They are strictly hard beans with a smoky flavour and a slightly acidic. We've also got French roast, and the flavour that comes across in French roast coffee usually has more to do with the roasting process than the actual quality of the beans. By the time the beans are dark enough to qualify as French, most of their original flavour has dissipated. In its place come the flavours of caramelising sugar, bittersweet coffee and often a bit of chocolate. And finally, espresso smoky, that is, coffee brewed by forcing a small amount of nearly boiling water under pressure through finely ground coffee beans. Espresso is generally thicker than coffee brewed through other methods, has a higher concentration of suspended and dissolved solids, and has creamer on top. As a result of the pressurised brewing process, the flavours and chemicals in a typical cup of espresso are very concentrated. Espresso is also the base for other drinks, such as café latte, cappuccino, café macchiato, café mocha, flat white or café americano. That is the end of section 2. You now have half a minute to check. Section 3. You will hear two students talking about the MOA with the lecturer. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Thank you all for coming here today to hear about the moa, a kind of animal which has been extinct for a long time. Well, first of all, we look at what the moa are. 
The moa are nine species of flightless birds endemic to New Zealand. They were the dominant herbivores in New Zealand's forest, shrubland, and subalpine ecosystems for thousands of years. But around 500 years ago, they all went extinct. When I mention extinct animals during ancient times, you may immediately think of dinosaurs, which disappeared around 66 million years ago. Fossils of dinosaurs, which we use to study, are large in number. But not many of those of moa remain, though both animals appeal to people today. So the moa sound more mysterious now. But sir, I've got a question about these flightless birds. How can we distinguish them from other birds? That's a good question. Birds are commonly characterized by being warm-blooded, having feathers and wings, usually capable of flight, and laying eggs. While the flightless moa, until their extinction, Were the largest birds in the world. Their heads are relatively small in relation to their bodies, and they are the only wingless birds lacking even the vestigial wings and substantial tail bones in their family. That's impressive. But were they born to be like that? I mean, when they were chicks. Yes, absolutely. So let's move on to the chicks. The eggs of moa were laid in nests and incubated for about two months. The chicks would be well developed upon hatching. And probably would be able to leave the nests to feed on their own almost immediately. I've heard that the male moa are thought to have incubated the eggs. Is that true? I think there is a possibility for that. I've read somewhere that the sex-specific DNA recovered from the outer surfaces of eggshells suggested that these eggs were likely to have been hatched by the male. But we still need to consult more. But I have a question. There has been some occasional speculation that the moa was still alive. Because someone said they had caught sight of them in New Zealand in the late 19th century, or even the 20th. Do you think it's possible? I'm not amazed by that, since that kind of thing has been claimed several times. But I find it funny because no reliable evidence of moa tracks has ever been found, and experts still contend that moa survival is extremely unlikely. So, what was the reason for the moa's extinction? I wonder if it was global warming or some other factors related to their living environment. Well, before the arrival of human settlers in New Zealand, the moa's only predator was the massive harz eagle. Then the Maori arrived sometime before CE 1300, and all moa genera were soon driven to extinction by hunting. What a horrible thing! Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. All right. Now let's look at the features of some species of moa. The South Island giant moa may have been the tallest birds ever known, and the second tallest of the nine moa species is the North Island giant moa, with the females being markedly larger than males, both in weight and height. And I've heard that the smallest of the moa birds are the coastal moa. Is that right? Yes, you were right. And have you heard about any other kind of moa before? I know the crested moa. The eggs they laid may be larger than others. As they mainly lived in the remote interior of the southern island, their fossils are rare or absent in archaeological sites, and no egg remains have yet been identified. Are there any species of moa that have got more fossils? Yes, of course. A considerable amount of remains of the stout-legged moa exist, due to the well-preserved properties of their habitat. Their skulls reveal relatively bad vision, a good sense of smell, and a very short bill. Then there is the eastern moa. They were remarkable in having very long and narrow windpipes, which probably enabled them to make louder, more resonant calls than those of other moa, and had the greatest vocal abilities. So they could communicate when they could not see each other in the forest or at night. They used a range of senses, apart from sound, in their search for food, such as their sense of smell and vision. That is the end of section three. 
You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear a lecture about how carbon dioxide is produced from food and what are the effects of the emission problem. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming to today's lecture. In the last few decades, the environmental impact of food production and consumption has become one of the greatest concerns. When we look at what we eat and how we produce the food, we can find extensive evidence for how we damage our environment. Greenhouse gas emissions may come from livestock such as cows, agricultural soils and rice production. According to statistics, the carbon dioxide emissions from the production of the food people consume every day are almost the same as the emissions we make when we are driving. Let's look at some more specific examples. The cultivation and processing of 100 grams of coffee beans are responsible for 140 grams of carbon dioxide. Now, some international organizations are training farmers in many countries to use sustainable agricultural methods as a way of reducing their carbon dioxide emissions. All agricultural practices have been found to have a variety of effects on the environment. Some of the environmental effects are associated with meat production. The popular red meat requires 28 times more land to produce than chicken, 11 times more water and results in 5 times more climate warming emissions. According to another research, cooking process also causes greenhouse gas emissions. Scientists now are working on how to best minimize its impact. Another problem that we cannot neglect is the packaging of food products. As packaging takes a lot of energy, water and other natural resources to produce. So a lot of natural resources are wasted when we throw the packaging materials away. Furthermore, packaging waste produces a big amount of greenhouse gas. To make things even worse, the food we eat often comes from places far away. Therefore, the transportation of our food across long distances contributes to air and water pollution. In recent decades, with the growing number of population, more food is in demand. So more land has been used to produce food. Hundreds and even thousands of forests have been cut down. It had a devastating effect on the climate because forests can absorb greenhouse gases. People in different parts of the world apply various kinds of farming practices. In most countries, cows and other livestock are kept on the farms, while in some countries they are kept in a restricted area on a mountain. But they all contribute to the carbon dioxide emissions. And for animal agriculture, the problem can be more serious because the livestock need food all the time. In America, cows eat an overwhelming amount of corn and soybeans each year. In order to create a better world for us and our future generations, we should adopt sustainable agriculture. The goal of sustainable agriculture is to meet the world's growing demand for food at the present without affecting future generations. Every person involved in the food system, growers, food processors, distributors, retailers, consumers and waste managers can play a role in ensuring a sustainable agricultural system.
There are many practices commonly used by people working in sustainable agriculture and sustainable food systems. Crop growers may change their food production methods to prevent pollution, although some other areas of agriculture are very hard to change, such as fishing. Consumers and retailers concerned with sustainability can look for foods that are environmentally friendly. However, sustainable agriculture is more than a collection of practices. It is also a process of negotiation, a push and pull between the competing interests of an individual farmer or of people in a community as they work to solve complex problems about how we grow our food. In conclusion, I want to emphasize that we may not be able to go back to the old times and live a simpler lifestyle, but we can take an active role in preventing more environmental problems caused by carbon dioxide emissions. In the next lecture, I will share some of the studies and effective solutions with you. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.